Thank you. Thank you. Uh, give me a second to sort this out. All right, I think this will work. Um, as mentioned, I'm going to talk about product strategy for teams. I hear myself, and I kind of hate this. Um, anyways, and um, I'll get into the weeds in a second. Um, but I, I want to start with a video, which is going to kind of like subtweet my entire point. Um, that like the strategy doesn't really matter. It's actually about the craft work that goes into what you're building. Um, but before I do that, I'm Stephen Walker. I lead product management here at Product Board in Europe. Um, Ane's on my team. I made him sit in the front, so that's how you know uh, I've got some sort of sway in, in this company. But uh, jokes aside, I'll, uh, I'll kick it off. And um, for those who don't know me, every great presentation starts with either a quote from Steve Jobs or a video of Steve Jobs. So with that, let me kick it off. It's the disease of thinking that a really great idea is 90% of the work. And that if you just tell your, all these other people, you know, here's this great idea, then of course they can go off and make it happen. And the problem with that is, is that there's a, just a tremendous amount of craftsmanship in, in between a great idea and a great product. And as you evolve that great idea, it changes and grows. It never comes out like it starts because you learn a lot more as you get into the subtleties of it. And you also find there's tremendous trade-offs that you have to make. I mean, you know, there are, there are just certain things you you can't make electrons do. There are certain things you can't make plastic do or glass do. And, and, and as you get into, or factories do, or robots do. And as you get into all these things, designing a product is keeping 5,000 things in your brain, these concepts, and fit, fitting them all together in, in, in kind of continuing to push to fit them together in new and different ways to get what you want. And every day you discover something new that is a new problem or a new opportunity to fit these things together a little differently. And it's that process that is the magic. All right. So I'm going to talk about product strategy. I'm going to give you a template to use and some ideas to use. Um, but the reason I started with this is um, you can write down the best strategy of all time. And you can think that you have the best ideas, but it's actually in the execution. So if you kind of walk away and kind of blank out over the next 30 minutes, um, just remember, like, write down your strategy, but then the next day, like, do exceptionally great work. So anyways. So um, I'll talk about product strategy. Uh, this is one of the best books on strategy, good strategy, bad strategy. Um, and, you know, it talks a lot about what a coherent strategy is, you know, that it's, it's focused, it's really defining what the biggest problems for your business are, how you're going to overcome them, and, like, what is the objective that's, um, you know, in, in the way or, or that you need to achieve. Um, but what's really interesting is this book never shows you what a good product strategy looks like. What is the artifact? And, you know, I talk to the PMs here that I lead. I mentor PMs. I coach new VPs of product, and the number one thing that they ask is, what's the artifact look like? Like, what do I put in my slides? What's the document? Like, how do I put a product strategy into a piece of paper? So I'm going to try to show you what that is. And uh, I don't know if I can move around. I'm going to move around anyways. Um, so there's company strategy. There's your overall product strategy. And then there's feature strategy. Most people in teams are working on features. And so predominantly, I'm going to be talking about feature level strategy today. And the big disclaimer is I'm going to give you tactics, but really you need to bring principles and like a really good mindset into what you're building. So you can have the best tools. You can have the best frameworks. Um, most frameworks are available for free on the internet. And it turns out that uh, not everyone is building exceptional billion dollar products overnight. And so it's actually much more about the mindset and principles, than the tactics. And what's interesting and kind of how I'll couch all of this is um, most people are actually operating in an environment that doesn't have a strategy. Like the company doesn't have a strategy. And I found this data point uh, 
which said 95% of employees don't understand the company's strategy. I think it's more like 95% of businesses actually don't have a strategy, so their employees don't know what it is or can't understand it because it's non-existent. Um, and so if you're you know, one of the lucky 5% that do understand it, um, a lot of these things will be applicable to you, but I'm gonna start from this basis of um, the assumption that the majority of these people in the room uh, are in a company that has uh, poorly communicated or non-existent strategy. Um, and so to take you through some principles of thinking behind what I'll show you, um, the first is that there's power in a movement. And what do I mean by this? Um, one person with an idea that's in opposition of what everyone else is doing is crazy. Two people is a conspiracy, and three people is journalistic credibility that this is an accurate thing. And so you hear this thing about product trios, that the PM, the designer, and the engineer should work together. If you want to start small and make change in your organization, take your idea and go find two other people who also believe in your idea because it's much, much harder to stamp it out when there's three or more of you who are talking about it. The second principle to think about is the power of language. So if you're trying to make change, a lot of PMs, what I hear is, um, how do I introduce strategy when my company doesn't have a strategy? Or how do I stop being a feature factory and how do I work with like outcomes instead of outputs when all we have to do is work in a certain way? There's a, a really small nuance that you can use which is start using language like bets or experiments. And what it does is it reduces the risk that when you're talking to people about your ideas that it's like, it's not a permanent thing necessarily. It's like, you know, it's just a bet. It's just an experiment. And you can start small. You could say, hey, can I spend 20% of my time on this bet? We see how it turns out in like 12 weeks. And if it works out, let's go further, right? So you're not asking for massive commitment. You're just starting small. Um, the next is that insights are the foundation, and I'll show you this later. Um, every great strategy has like a very, very deep, nuanced understanding of the market, uh, the customer, and, and the world. And I actually heard this story recently about uh, Four Seasons. In the 1980s, um, the average turnover of a hotel employee was something like 12 weeks, 24 weeks, something like this. And Four Seasons realized that if they were ever going to have the best hotel experience that would be five star and up and people would pay thousands of dollars per night to stay there, they would have to change something. And so what they did is they made internal changes so that the average tenure of an employee was actually something like years or decades. And so for them to have a great customer experience, for them to have a great business strategy, they actually had to change their employment strategy. And it, put them in a completely different category than any other employer who was trying to deliver sort of this upscale hotelier type experience. Um, and this only comes from having like a very, very deep understanding of what's going on in the world and how can we play a different game. Um, and I mentioned this in the description, but uh, people are afraid of being a, a feature factory or they're afraid of output. Um, the, the reality of this is like, you will learn from any action you take and so action is actually far better than inaction. So if you're kind of stuck, you don't know what's gonna move the metrics, you don't know what these outcomes should be, the reality is you should just do something because if you do anything, you're gonna learn something. Uh, probably that that's not the right idea, but at least you'll know that's for sure. Check that off the list, not the right idea. Um, so uh, that was kind of the prelude. What does it look like? Um, if you Google, Product Strategy Product Board. This is the number one result. There's a whole blog article. This template's available for you to download. You can use it, you can steal it. Uh, you can take a photo of it now. Um, I'll walk through this, but basically the purpose of this is to anyone outside of that trio that you're gonna turn into your co-conspirators that they can't shut down, um, you just really concisely describe what's your team's vision, what business problem are you solving, who are you solving this for, and what are the goals, measures, and tactics or bets that you're taking for whatever that time period is? And this one happens to be uh, one year. And anyone who's on a team can do this. No one's gonna stop you from saying, hey, here's our strategic view of the world. Um, and then when you go to your manager, when you go to other teams, you can actually have a really healthy discussion about where we're we trying to take this thing. So I'll dig into some of these pieces. 
And then I'll show you an example for Instagram. I don't have any insider information about Instagram, so uh, it's kind of a, a wild ass guess, but um, at least you'll get the point. So the first, the vision. Um, the way to think about vision, there's all these templates for product vision, there's all these books, there's all these like best practices. The easiest way to think about this is for the people who use your product, if you are successful at building a great product for them, what's different? What are they doing? What are your competitors stealing from you because you did that? It's super easy. It's really fun when you find that trio of people, go lock yourself in a room and talk about the future. It's all you have to do. And then you just figure out a way to boil that down into a sentence and that's your product vision. The objective, super easy. What's the biggest problem that your team is solving for your business? Just write it down. And the more that you can be clear and concise, the less resistance you're gonna have from any sort of manager who thinks that you're working on the wrong problem. Because you're like, look, I'm doing all this in service to solve this problem that we have as a business. Ideal customer profile, um, get specific. So like some people say our users are product makers or our users are PMs. Um, you should actually get very, very specific about who is gonna use your feature every single day and love it. And so at, at Product Board, we actually talk about different roles in a specific side of, size of company with specific organizational structures because those organizational structures have a level of complexity that Product Board finds or delivers value for. Um, and I'll show you an example for a B2C product. Um, it's, it's not sort of rocket science. The way that I think about it, if you've nailed it right, you can go on LinkedIn or you can go to your phone book or you can go to Facebook or you can ask around and you can easily find within an hour a person who matches this profile. Like if you can't do that, you don't have a specific ideal customer profile. Um, and then you saw this in the template. Um, I'll show an example of this, but um, you wanna connect your goals, your measures and your bets. And the reason you do this is it's super simple to say, here's what we're trying to do, here's how we keep score, and here's some actions that we're gonna take. Whether you call them projects or tactics or bets, it doesn't really matter. It's so easy to see, here's what we're thinking about this. And you're gonna learn a lot more later, and you saw in the intro quote, like stuff's gonna to come to light as you move forward. You're gonna learn a lot when you actually get into the weeds and you're figuring out what works and what doesn't work. So, um, for the example, we're gonna imagine we're on the creators team for Instagram. Uh, our whole thing is we're dealing with a bunch of problems. Um, if you're paying attention to the news, you know, one, uh, Apple is killing us. Um, they're basically making it incredibly hard to retarget, so our ad revenue is going down. Um, we need to find a new way to generate money as a business. The second is uh, suddenly we have competition. Um, there's some Chinese company that's uh, deploying a new version of spyware that's so good that people are being sucked away from our app to their app. The third is there's this rise of, uh, let's call them the creatorpreneur. It's the people who don't wanna work for a shitty job with a shitty boss and they wanna create their own hours and they wanna follow their passion and they wanna monetize their creativity um, and they wanna do it on a platform like ours. And the last is, uh, we have some very, very vocal influencers who are going on the news, going on our platform, and basically talking shit that as we try to chase that competition that's deploying that spyware, uh, they hate our platform more and more. And so if you think about this, this is sort of insights for my team, the way to think about what are the problems and what are the opportunities for us to solve? What's sort of the context that we're operating in the world right now? So the vision, um, I want my team to position Instagram as the leading platform for creators to build their audience, their careers, and their financial independence. It's a super simple phrase, um, but it has a lot of things behind it. Um, it sort of implies that uh, a couple of years from now, when anyone asks, hey, I want to uh, be a professional skydiver and I want to monetize my hobby, where do I go? It's I go to Instagram. Um, when I want to turn that into my career, I know that I have the tools to do that. And from a financial independence perspective, I know that I can quit my job and do that full time. Business objective, uh, I sort of inferred this, but um, we need to find a way to generate revenue beyond ads. And so if we're making it easy for creators to monetize their content, we can potentially take a percentage of that 
whether they're selling products or they're selling ads inside of their posts, um, it generates a new revenue stream beyond the core one that we're losing money uh, on because of Apple. Ideal customer profile, so I was very specific in this. Um, we're targeting creators with over 100,000 followers already. And the reason is, if we went after sort of the low end market, we might have to figure out tools that help them build their audience. But what we actually wanna focus on is tools that help them monetize their audience. And so we're going to assume that they have somewhat of an audience already so that we have a jumping off point to actually focus on. And we are maybe saying another team figures out how to take the people from zero to 100,000. And then, you know, I made this up just as an example, but, you know, one of our objectives could be we want to grow audience engagement with monetized creator content. Right? Super, super clear objective. That's what we're trying to do. How do we know that we are succeeding? You could measure this a million different ways, and I chose a very specific leading indicator, which is the creation of monetized content. Not the engagement of it, not some sort of lagging metric, but that, that content's actually being generated on the platform. Um, and the reason for this is you can see this really early on. And then I picked some random bets. One is we need an algorithm that prioritizes it. So um, we had those Kardashian influencers complaining. The reason they're complaining is their content's not being engaged with. The second is we need to come up with some new tools to actually create monetized content. Um, the tools that we have aren't working at the level that we want them. Um, and the last is we need to create sort of a flywheel of engagement. So we need to tell creators what content's working and what content's not working so that they create more content. Um, and the reason I chose this objective is that in theory, if there's more content on the platform and our creators are monetizing it, they're happy, they're gonna create more content. And that's more content that we can, as a business, skim 15% off like you know, any corrupt uh, imperialist uh, company might do. Uh, but jokes aside, like, you need them creating content so that you can drive revenue from it as a business. So again, super easy. You can actually write way more content than this, but if you can't distill it down to something this simple, you need to spend more time kind of talking through it with your team and figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Talk to other teams, talk to your managers, um, but definitely find a trio, find more people beyond that trio um, and get different perspectives. I think that's it. Ah, one more thing. So oh, every good presentation ends with a Jeff Bezos quote. So you gotta, you gotta know the, the, the pecking order, right? Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos. Um, and you know, we always want this perfect data, and I'm, I'm sorry that I'm kind of like, you know, North Star Metric's great, um, but uh, you know, he says, if you can make a decision with analysis, you should do so. But it turns out in life that your most important decisions are always made with instinct, intuition, taste, and heart. And it means that you can't always spreadsheet your way into finding a winning solution. Sometimes you have to take a risk, you have to trust your instinct, you have to talk to your customers enough to have good taste to know what's gonna work for them, um, and you have to have a great designer in your team. And that's it. I think I have questions on the internet. I'm also happy to take questions from you guys. Uh, I don't know if they said, but you can put questions in the Slido as well. There's no questions, so I'll just take questions. I'm happy to answer anything. People ask me stuff like, what's the best marketing email for PMs? I don't know that one. People ask me, what's the best metric to use? I don't know that one either. But uh, I get a lot of questions about, should I write just a doc? Should I put it in Notion? Should I make a PowerPoint? Yes. I'm sorry, can you speak to this box? <laughs> Uh, hello. Um, uh, you're saying that you're a PM for Europe and uh, there is some PM for US or, or North and South America. So what's the difference between products and uh, between audience? Uh, so uh, I should have clarified. I just look after the team that's here. We're, we look after our global audience. So we actually don't split the PM team by uh, geographies yet. So it's more about... Um, there's uh, someone who looks after and coaches the, the PMs who are in North America. Um, it's different than me. So products are the same for both, all geography. Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you.
Okay, nobody saw that. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Just don't be shy, it's gonna be fine. You can call on people. <laughs> All right, guys, I appreciate it. I'll be around and uh, I think we'll take a small break and then uh, Anna and Roz will be up next. Thank you.